Joining me now here on the Knicks Film School pregame show. I gotta be honest, folks. Um, I, I almost feel bad doing this because we've been experiencing joy and jubilation and the vibes being so immaculate here in New York. And we're going to welcome on my good friend, Richie Randall, who's been covering the 20 and 46 Charlotte Hornets. And I almost feel bad doing this intro, but here's the deal. He's an Atlanta Braves fan. So you got to enjoy baseball season, Richie. I get to enjoy basketball season and we'll, we'll hopefully have a good conversation previewing this game. But I am curious about how, the vibes have been for the Hornets this year. Richie Randall, who covers the uh, Charlotte Hornets for, um, oh my gosh, my for, forgetting, I'm blanking on the name. What's the name of the pod again? Buzzbeat. Buzzbeat. That's right. I, do, I love the name of the pod too, which is why it's annoying that I forgot the name of the pod. <laughs> Richie, how have you been? And um, well, let's start here. Let's let's forget about the Hornets completely. Are you ready for opening day? Opening day. I, I guess I'm ready. I guess I'm ready. But it's funny you talk about you get to enjoy basketball season while I get to enjoy and look forward to baseball season. But the mm -hmm. gap between the Braves and the Mets feel a little bit closer than the Hornets <laughs> and the Knicks here. So just it's, a little, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can still enjoy baseball season too when it comes around the corner. So see, here's the problem though. And it's a, it's a product of their own design with the New York Mets is that like the Braves lose, they won the World Series two years ago. So it's like, all right, we're only two years removed from a World Series and we get to enjoy, you know, members of the team that won it are still currently on our roster. So we can look back fondly at some of those memories if we need to. It's just a simple YouTube search. Um, the Mets not only don't have that, but um, they spent more money than any team has ever spent in an offseason. So... Um, I, the laughs and the jokes and the memes are already being written and in the drafts. And if they get eliminated at the end of the season, the jokes will start coming. I already can hear everybody yelling at us on the podcast and on YouTube to stop talking about baseball. <laughs> so let's get into the this matchup against the Hornets. Um, yeah, I last time we talked to you, we were trying to trade Julius Randle to the Hornets. <laughs> Needless to say, he's gone one way and uh, the Hornets really didn't like do anything. Obviously the, the, the bridges stuff is, is looming over all of this um, complete picture of how this season has gone. And obviously there's a, there's a Wembenyama aspect of this that I want to talk to you about, but the vibes in Charlotte, how disappointing has this been? How quickly did you realize this is the direction the season we're going? How are you taking all of this, this season? Yeah, the vibes just aren't great. I think it started with the offseason with everything that just went wrong for the Hornets, the coaching search, right? With Kenny Atkinson being hired. And then a week later, he backed out the Miles Bridges situation where I believe it was on the eve of free agency where that comes about the domestic violence arrest. And so heading into the season, there wasn't a ton of high hopes for the Hornets, but maybe you thought with LaMelo Ball and maybe with some potential health that they could have done a little bit better than where they're at right now. I think a lot of people probably wanted them to kind of lean into the rebuild and playing the younger players. And so that's what's been weird about this season is that before the deadline, Clifford was wanting to win. It's it's not like the 20 and 46 record that you see here is because they are just simply playing the younger players. He was leaning into Mason Plumley. Like Mason Plumley was getting a ton of minutes and a lot of Hornets fans were clamoring for Mark Williams and even Nick Richards who had a very good start to the season. But yeah, overall just kind of taking a, a kind of a big picture view of this team. It, they are they're just very very poor on both ends of the court it's a uh, it's a hard watch sometimes the game against the the most recent game against the nets like for three quarters or for almost three quarters it was just pain, painful to watch so in terms of just like the atmosphere that surrounds hornets fandom it's it's not great right now i guess the only thing and you kind of mentioned this the only thing that you can kind of look forward to is trying to get in the top Three top four picks, obviously the top one, top two players kind of are head and shoulders above three and four. But um, I, I kind of wish the Hornets would have leaned in a little bit earlier than they did. They, they waited all the way up until the deadline to make a trade. So obviously the Knicks finished better, but I can somewhat empathize with like, why, why are we still trying to win games? Because last season, you know, the Knicks went 37 and 45 and 
you could tell there was a three and 17 stretch from like mid July to mid February. And it was like very clear this season's going nowhere. Why are we still playing Kemba Walker? Why are we still playing Alec Burks? Why are we still playing Taj Gibson? Like these veterans that are taking up a bulk of the minutes. Why isn't Obi Toppin getting some run? Why isn't Jericho Sims getting some run? And after last night, you wonder if this Emmanuel quickly thing really should have started sooner. Um, so I can empathize with with that. Um, just, not to go too far behind the scenes, but like for you personally, and I guess uh, the 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 buzz the buzz beat guys. Um, like, how quickly did the the content plan change to like not necessarily not caring about the results of games, but like how, like have you started doing draft coverage? How soon did like if they did win a game, did that like change be the perspective because there's obviously um, a tankathon website that exists and it's affected not by wins, but honestly more affected by losses in this sense. Yeah. The, the tankathon website is definitely a bookmark of mine. Yeah. It's, it's, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting question because we are all like four different personalities on the pod. We all have our own specialties. I feel like I focus mainly on the on-court stuff, which has been very difficult this year. So even when they do win or even when they do shut a star player down, it just feels so weird to have a conversation, a post-game pod about how the Hornets slowed down Giannis to nine points when their record you know, doesn't reflect any kind of success that they've been having. In terms of you know, content. We've been making more podcasts with like big picture topics about some of the younger players, focusing more on them. We did have a guest come on and speak about some draft uh, picks. I am not a guy that gets into, you know, the coverage of the draft until like May. So you ask me about anyone, like even Victor, I, I couldn't even give you the lowdown on Victor. <laughs> uh, but but the other co-hosts are definitely itching to get their uh, their mics talking about the the draft, and I think we'll probably get to to that soon. Uh, but yeah, it, it's been a very disappointing season in terms of covering the on court performance, and that's that's what I feel like I do the best at. But uh, when there's been so many things that have been going wrong, even the injuries too. Like when you look back and you know kind of count up the injuries with Ball missing close to thirty games, Hayward's missed about 25 games, Ubre's missed 20 plus games. And then Cody Martin probably has been the biggest disappointment in terms of his on-court health. He's played in seven games in total. So that's like four guys there in your top seven to eight in your rotation that are just miss missing huge chunks of your time. So of the young guys, if you, I'm sure there are, are Knicks fans out there that have no idea what young guys you might be referring to. Um, who's the one that excites you the most? And look, this is just pure ignorance and me not, obviously I wasn't watching the Nets game yesterday, but um, I had no idea if Mikhail Luke is now a member of the Hornets. And like this guy was the next 11th or 12th man for most of the year. And then after the uh, Josh Hart trade, obviously I'm assuming bo uh, Portland bought him out and he ended up in Charlotte and he played 10 minutes last night. So is he like, part of the rotation right now or is was that just because the game got out of hand um what it, is he one of the young guys that you're looking at at the moment i i, I tend to say no he's not okay. one of the young guys you're, you're correct it kind of got out of hand and clifford was just like let me put Sfi in and, and see what he can do i was actually disappointed in that trade in terms of how the hornets acquired Sfi because they they got rid of Jalen mcdaniels and Jalen mcdaniels is a uh. young guy that i really love and i feel like he's making an impact over in philly right now and He's a two-way guy. I get that he was a free agent this upcoming offseason. So I, I think that's maybe why they traded him. Maybe they thought that there were some other plans in the works. And who knows what they're doing with Miles Bridges in terms of uh, saving a roster spot for him. But yeah, in terms of the young guys, there's probably two guys that I would point to. And I think one is the, an obvious one in terms of their most recent draft pick. I, I would say that Bryce McGowan's is probably a guy that's under the radar that not many Knicks fans really should know about. I mean, he's not a guy that's very prominent in, in the rotation. He's had inconsistent minutes in terms of uh, seeing some time in Greensboro with the G League affiliate, but also coming up. And he's a guy that has done so much better than James Booknight. Like when you hear of James Booknight a couple of years ago when he got drafted, he has completely fallen out of the rotation. So mm. do not expect to see him play against the Knicks. I, I say that, watch him just pop up out of nowhere. But <laughs> Bryce McGowan's is a guy that can get downhill, get to the rim. He makes quick decisions. 
he still has a lot to room, a lot of room for improvement. He get, I get it. He's only 20 years old, but I guess the biggest player in terms of the young guys is Mark Williams. And that's really the only reason why I'm watching right now, Andrew, mm-hmm. is because of Mark Williams. Like if it wasn't for him and his promise, there'd probably be less, you know, interest around this team. And I guess the disappointing part is he is such a seamless partner with LaMelo Ball because of what they can do together in the pick and roll. He's got a huge base. He can set good screens, frees up plenty of space. And then you've got defenses that have got to worry about the fact that LaMelo can shoot from, you know, four feet behind the arc and, you know, kind of that give and take there and who you want to defend and uh, that lob radius and wingspan. So they've only played about 300 minutes together but he's a good rebounder. He's a good rim protector. And he's just showing signs of little things here and there that he's going to build on over the off season, moving into next, next season as well. So yeah. I'll say Mark Williams obviously is, is the obvious one. Yeah. I'm looking at his lineup data now and cleaning the glass in in just about, uh, well, so it's a little less than 600 possessions, 600 minutes this season, I should say uh, he's plus 3.1. Um, And look, I I can understand that being a real um, thing to look at and and wonder what this could be in the future with with LaMelo. The this sounds a lot like two. Wow, this is years ago now, I guess three or four years ago when the Knicks went 17 and 65 and midway through the season traded Porzingis and uh, Mitchell Robinson was the only reason I was watching basketball games for the second half of the season. And um Obviously, there's a big injury to uh, there was a big injury to a Nick that led to that season becoming that. Uh, and there's a big injury that has happened to the Hornets in the sense of LaMelo Ball. Um, I'm coming at this from an outsider's perspective here. And I'm 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 almost wondering if this is like an annoying question that you get a lot about his extension. Um how how do you see that playing out? Because he's extension eligible this summer. And I don't know if like there is national conversations being had about like, oh, he's going to be the first one to walk in and say, um, I'm I'm going to take the qualifying offer. And look, with his injury history and I mean, I don't mean this disrespectfully. I'm just going off the history with certain decisions that have been made by the Hornets ownership in the past. They might refuse to even give him the extension because of his injury history. So how do you ex- how do you see this playing out? You is he here for the long term, you think? I would hope so. And I would hope that the Hornets would offer that thing immediately uh, when it's available. You know, we were having this conversation on, on Buzz Beat the other day because you do have the ability to give a, a four year extension or a five year extension. And you do wonder if that fifth year could be uh, some kind of, uh, you know, there's something in the contract to where he has to play X amount of games or, or some kind of incentives that way. Uh, but I, I think the Hornets should be making this decision because they're such a small market team and because they lucked into him in the 2020 draft. We were talking about this the other day, like Hornets moved up to the third overall pick. And then also they lucked into the fact that Golden State chose Wiseman, who's now a Detroit Piston, Mm -hmm. over Mello. And you just don't get that opportunity too often. And he is the engine that makes this offense run. And you saw... Last or a couple nights ago against the Nets, just the offense, the offense in general is just so vanilla when he is, when he's not out there, there's no creativity and the efficiency numbers all over the the board are just lacking. They are bottom 10 everywhere on the court when it comes to shooting efficiency. And so the facilitation just is, is strictly on his shoulders for this team. And I do think that the Hornets would, would be wise to make this decision and, and extend him immediately. I I think the injury history, Andrew, I think that's something that you do have to think about the most recent injury that he had. And I don't know what you think about this. I'm no doctor. You're, you're not a doctor, are you? No, not (laughs) not yet. At least no. What are your thoughts on like non-contact injuries versus contact injuries? Cause I, I was having this conversation, like at least with a contact injury, you can kind of point to, okay, he stepped on somebody's ankle and rolled it. But the most recent one that he had, he was just dribbling and his ankle gave way. To me, that seems more concerning. Yeah, the the Porzingis injury that he suffered with the Knicks was... So it was a contact injury, but it, like no one hit the knee. He just landed uh-huh. wrong after he... He actually like dunked on Giannis, and then when he came down, landed on his knee and tore his ACL. Um, 
that was that's a completely different uh, body, you know. Like the, the just looking at him, you almost kind of expected him on draft night. It's like, oh, he's gonna probably tear something, um, just with the, his frame, you know. Um, and with Lamelo, I mean, yeah, it would give me me pause, I guess. As uh, this is where I guess, like you're right, a doctor would have to come in and tell you pro- projecting um, whether or not this would take away an element of his game, you know, like, will he be, will he lose a step? Will some of that burst go away now that it's a lower body injury? Like those are the questions I have about Zion to be completely honest. The fact that like all of his injuries are lower body and that's like a, that's a big dude that is going to have to, you know, balance himself and, and stay on the court with, you know, the amount of weight that he seems to play at consistently. So, um, yeah, I, I think that there's two different arguments at play of whether it's a good investment because of his health and whether it's a, just a good investment because he was drafted third overall and you might as well build around him while you have the ability to, you know? Yeah. And I think one thing too, with the injury, he's always been a finesse player mm. and he's a guy that doesn't get to the hoop a lot. He doesn't attack as much as you'd like. And because of that, he's not getting to the free throw line enough. And he, he's a good free throw shooter. Like you want him on the line, but he's just not getting there enough. And he hasn't really proven that through the course of his three seasons. And so you just wonder with these injuries that pile up with him, does that make him be a, a player that just sticks on the perimeter? Like he's a volume shooter from three point range and he doesn't want to get downhill. So like, I wonder if that's in the back of his mind sometimes that, you know, obviously his body's not built in a way that can sustain a lot of contact around the rim, but he is just not getting inside the paint as much as you would like. He tends to have these like crazy wrong leg floaters and jumpers kind of on the edge of the paint. And, you know, he does have some great touch on his shot and it makes you turn your head and realize, wow, like this guy can make some very, very difficult shots. And he's a, he's a finesse player. So I, I do wonder if the injuries play into that and, I think Clifford, Steve Clifford was harping on it. Like he needs to pick his spots and get downhill and drive and get to the rim. That is one of the areas outside of his defense that I feel like he needs to improve on. But you, you got to wonder, like, do these injuries hold him back in that sense? Yeah, that video that Clifford of Clifford, um, Clifford, excuse me, um, the the video that went around of a press conference where he was answering a question about modern day offense offenses and like what's different than. Um, it, it reminded me a lot of baseball conversations I've had about how everybody's playing the exact same way today. It's why, like, honestly, like the, the, the way the Knicks are playing this year, that they're able to survive without really being a good shooting team. It's kind of refreshing that they're actually figuring out a way to score points. It may come back to hurt them in the playoffs, but um, like Doris Burke mentioned this on the Zach Lowe pod last week, like it's very much what Memphis tried to do last year, where they're trying to play the possession game rather than like, it, like no matter what, we will get two points or points on this possession, even if it means our our first shot isn't always quality and our second and third and fourth shots are always going to be quality because of offensive rebounding. And that just was like a very self-aware, like veteran head coach, it seems that understood the path that it was going to take for the team coaches to compete in the future. Um, I wonder how a Hornet fan feels about that video or I guess in particular, the, the season he's had, especially since he was the head coach of the, the Hornets like most re- very recently. Um, so in your mind, how is this season gone with, with him? And uh, you know, is he the, is he the coach of the future? Or is he just kind of the coach for right now while they're in somewhat of a rebuild? I tend to think he's just the coach for right now. And I don't know how many years that right now is going to be. Mm -hmm. And and he's a guy, even in his first stint with Charlotte, he's very defensive minded. And he's a guy that just like, he loves to focus on like the four factors, like turnover percentage, offensive rebounds, limiting second shots and all that type of stuff. And Mm. um, it's it's just a very odd way of thinking about it. And I may not odd, but he he just is very stubborn about what he likes out of his team. And, the Hornets have done that to an extent. They're eighth best at limiting turnovers. They're 16th best middle of the road at crashing the offensive rebound and getting those. So that is part of his DNA. And 
obviously has not equated to wins by any means, but he, he loves to kind of stick to those pillars uh, in terms of his teaching philosophies. And offensively, like if you just look at the numbers, they're, they're last in the NBA. Mm. And defensively, they're, they're 22nd in the NBA. So even though he's a defensive coach, he overall, he has not been able to get the most out of this team. I, I was hoping... I know this is not really a high bar, but I, I was hoping that the Hornets would be around 16, 17 or 18 on defense, just knowing that Clifford was coming in and that was his background. Now, I will say the last two weeks, though, they're second in the NBA uh, on defense. Really? Which, yeah. And I think a big reason for that, I mean, not, not the only reason, but a big reason for that is Mark Williams, just having that guy on the back end and and knowing that even if you do get beat, you have someone back there that is going to erase shots at the rim. Clifford did speak that the on-ball defense has been better in recent weeks. But overall, from you know the start of the season till now, I kind of hoped that the team would have been a little bit better on defense. You saw individual flashes like Ubre, who's not a defensive-minded guy, was getting his hands in passing lanes. Lamelo showed some spurts of defensive flashes here and there, but in terms of like Clifford, the coach, and how I viewed him this season, like I, I just think he's gotten like a, a C, you know, just right down the middle of the road, and I, I think that with the way that the coaching hire was with Atkinson and getting it over to Clifford, it's almost like they ran out of options. Like it was, it, they needed to have a coach for the draft. They needed to have a coach for free agency. And it's like, okay, let me go to somebody that's familiar with the organization. Obviously he had a good relationship with Michael Jordan as well. So I don't know how many more years, but I, I guess the one good thing about Clifford is he's he he's set some good examples with some of those four factors in terms of, you know, boxing out and, and, and being hard on guys when they don't do that type of stuff. So even if he's not like this young and up and coming coach that relates to the guys, at least he can kind of set some boundaries on both ends of the court and especially the defensive side of the court, even though it's not resulted necessarily in, you know, team success. As somebody who's watched Tom Thibodeau over the last three years, I can understand a rigid, stubborn head coach. While I, I can't really say too much bad about him this season, like it took a while before the Knicks finally settled on a rotation that wasn't playing Derrick Rose or Evan Fournier. It was maximizing some of the younger players that could impact winning. But they are a team that is his identity and is playing with his intensity. And that that has to come a degree from the head coach, you know, leave it up to every fan to himself deciding what degree that that specifically comes from. You did mention that it did take a while before the, uh, the younger players, uh, if even if that has started, some of the younger players got a chance to showcase themselves um, before um, th this season. And there's some veterans, obviously the Kelly Oubre's of the world, the Terry Rozier's of the world, the Gordon Hayward's, um, do you expect like long term are these parts of the uh, are, are these assets or do you think next this off season is kind of the the year that um they start to move on from some of these vets or are these guys kind of part of the solution if you nail you know the right draft pick this summer? Yeah, I think a lot depends on where they fall in the lottery. Um I think that's going to dictate some of the things that they do in this off season. Kelly Oubre is up for a new contract. Uh, in this off season. And it's funny, he was very vocal about not wanting to be traded. Like he has enjoyed his time here in Charlotte. And obviously the lack of success this season hasn't, you know, swayed that decision. So all the way up until like the deadline, there was a, a newspaper article that came out in the Charlotte observer about him just wanting his name out of any kind of discussion. So it's pretty cool to hear that. I don't know if he's really the answer or if he's part of the solution moving forward, just because, He's probably better suited for a team that has a whole lot more talent around him, especially at this point in his career. He's a very streaky shooter. I mean, I think that a lot of teams could use him off the bench as a microwave scorer, but to put him in a role this year where you see him as a more prominent figure, it's just been weird. Like he's averaging 20 points. Don't get me wrong, but he's still not an efficient player. Like he's not going to light it up on a consistent basis. So for Kelly Oubre's sake, I would say no. Gordon Hayward's an interesting question. I think that he's actually been probably one of the better players for Charlotte since late January, early February. The problem with Gordon is not only his age, but his injuries, his contract. 
he he's a guy that like does very well. Like he's a very good basketball player in, in terms of scoring on all parts of the court. He's the adult on the court, quote unquote, mm-hmm. when you have a lot of guys out there that are making needless mistakes, he's a guy that can kind of slow it down, settle things down, he can even be a facilitator at times. I think that Terry Rozier has been placed in this, this role of a, a point guard now that LaMelo has gone and he's just not built for that role. So um, Hayward's going to be interesting because I think that with the way that he has played in the past you know, 15 to 20 games, I, I would say that his value is high. Obviously, the trade deadline has passed. He is on an expiring contract for, uh, God, I can't even remember how many how much money is left on that thing, but but it's a lot. It's a lot. And I, I personally have an affinity towards him because I think he can be a guy that does not lead by by voice or he's not a vocal leader, but on the court, when you do need to settle things down, I, I think he's been, I don't think a lot of people credit this, but I think he has been big for LaMelo's development, just, just making the right play and settling things down the half court. Even if that doesn't mean that he's some guy, rah, rah guy on the sidelines. I think, I think Ubre is more vocal, but to me, I, I don't know really how much he factors into the equation. So of those two veterans, I, I would say that Hayward has a better shot of staying. Obviously Ubre is a free agent, uh, but there's a, a lot of young guys too that that need to make their way up. I would really love for Dennis Smith Jr. to be to be back with this team. He's been probably one of the top three or four players in terms of just like the stories and and stuff like that. And obviously he's a local kid, so um, yeah. I mean, I, I, Uber doesn't seem like a guy that would be sticking around for too much longer. But because he's been vocal about staying in Charlotte, who knows? Who knows? You you almost perfectly segued into my next question about Dennis Smith Jr. Former Nick, the guy that they traded Kristaps Porzingis for. Um, yes, I know Knicks fans listening and watching. There was other things that were in that deal, uh, but he was supposed to be the young piece coming back. And yeah, I'm staring at his lineup data now over a thousand minutes this year, and he's got the best um on off differential of plus 5.7 in the 81st percentile now kai oh. jones technically is better but it's <laughs> in 220 minutes so i'm not gonna completely uh, look at that but uh cleaning the glass has this stat of expected wins and now it's not completely um reliable because i don't think dennis smith jr is responsible for plus 12 in wins this year but as somebody who remembers his struggles in New York. And I guess I kind of feel the same way about Cam Reddish. Like he needed to go somewhere where it didn't matter if he was contributing to winning. He just needed to contribute like in any way, shape or form. And so like just personally, it's, it's, I'm happy to see Dennis Smith Jr. Kind of find a home here in Charlotte. Is that, is that a fair assessment of what he, he's contributed to the Hornets this season? I think so. Yeah, it's 12 wins. We we'd have 8 wins, Andrew, without him. Without him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, he's uh he's been awesome. I, I think that, you know, coming off the bench, um a, a guy that brings a lot of energy. He is not a guy that shoots the ball well and, and and you know that. He's never really had that in his career, but he's got crazy athleticism. He can get downhill, he can pressure the rim. To me, he's actually a pretty underrated like facilitator. He's not necessarily like a passer, like the mellow ball by any means, but when he gets downhill, I think it collapses the defense and he can dump it off to a big, you know, my, Mark Williams, for example. So I think we'll see a lot of that moving forward with the mellow out of the picture and defensively, he's probably been Charlotte's best individual mm. defender, just one-on-one defender. He can body you up. He's also got the ability to get his hands in the passing lanes and, you know, he's not much of a shot blocker by any means, but he can definitely get up and, and try to block a shot. He is he's a springy guy. He brings energy. And I think the local connection with NC State, it, it, it's definitely something. And also too, the Hornets have been lacking a backup point guard for the longest time. It's, it's just been a running joke with this organization that it just comes in and out with these backup point guards. And I think the one of the better ones in, in, in previous seasons has been Devontae Graham, but he was traded off. Uh, Jeremy Lin, who's been on your podcast, um, uh-huh. but he had a, he was he had one year he got his he got his stock up and he went off to I believe Brooklyn after us. But yeah, I, I think that if the Hornets want to solidify, you know, their backup guard position, I think Dennis Smith would be awesome to bring back. And the thing is, he's only twenty five years old. It feels like he's like twenty eight, twenty nine. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's why, like there are a bunch of guys out there that the Knicks either failed to develop or just didn't work out here in New York. The Kevin Knoxes, the Frank Nilakinas, obviously the Cam Reddishes, and DSJ falls in that category where I just always have a, a warm place in my heart for, for him and happy to see him do well. And yes, that is what Jeremy Lin is known for going on our podcast. <laughs> the number one thing that people think of when they when they hear Jeremy Lin. I have two questions before I let you go. <clears throat> Michael Jordan. So obviously known outside of Charlotte as one of the greatest basketball players of all time, if not the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, Michael Jordan, the owner has not from my perspective had the most success in, in Charlotte. And I'm just, I've always wanted to know from like a Hornets fan and a, I guess a Hornets um, uh, insider, just like what it's it like to, to, to have that type of presence as your owner especially if he's not a good owner. Um, so how do you and I guess Hornets fans feel about MJ um, and the the job he's done since he he not only like he did bring like the Hornets back to Charlotte. So I guess that has to be a positive. But how do you feel about MJ? That might be his biggest positive, Andrew. Um, yeah. <laughs> is it the only one? <laughs> yeah, you kind, you kind of forget that he is the owner at times because he doesn't really show up to the games. I think a lot of people like love when they see him, you know, courtside and you know, giving players some advice on the sideline. I guess that's one thing that you got going for you. Like if you have an ex player, probably the best player of all time, like that, that's pretty cool. Like having the basketball side, but in terms of the, the ownership, I don't have strong feelings, but I know, I know a lot of people do have strong feelings on MJ and the fact that they feel like he needs to sell and get out. A lot of people complain that, He's stingy and just doesn't make the right moves with the money. And, and it seems like he overspends when he shouldn't and he doesn't spend when he should. And you just never know how much of a voice he has with some of the personnel decisions. I think sometimes you wonder if he has too much of a voice and he's overriding the GM and you wonder, like, let, let's just let the GM do his job. Like whoever that GM is, because we've had a couple under his tenure. It, it just feels like, oh, that feels like a Michael Jordan move. That just feels like a Michael mm -hmm. Jordan move. He always, he tends to go for guys that, and nothing wrong with this, but he tends to go with guys in college that have had like college success, like three, four years, which is again, nothing wrong, but like projecting them to the, to the next level. Sometimes that doesn't always equate like Frank Kaminsky. Like mm. that's, that's a guy when I think of Michael Jordan, I, I think of that type of pick. So no, I, I don't think he's viewed very highly of Michael of uh, Hornets fans around the the community. I don't really have strong thoughts just because I don't know how much of a say he has sometimes. But it's cool to have the name. But I think that's probably some of the uh, the biggest positives of having him as a owner. Yeah, it's not like a recruiting tool for free agency. No, you no. know, you know, especially and this is probably the most fascinating part about it. Like the upcoming generation and of young players, Michael Jordan's a meme. To them, you know, they they uh, like I, I'm I'm 34, so I I'm old enough to at least remember. Like I, I watched the the 98 finals live. I watched the 97 finals live on NBC. Like I remember where I was when I saw Game Six, the shot or the flu game, you know. And like my brother, who is 22 and like the same age as R.J. Barrett, um, Michael Jordan is like the guy whose face I used to put on every losing player's uh, <laughs> body whenever like, oh, the crying Jordan meme is making its way around the group chat, you know? So I, I don't know. The last dance might've helped that a little bit, but like if Kobe, yeah. were, well, yeah. if LeBron were to buy the team, um, then maybe that would actually have more influence nowadays. Um, okay. Last question before I let you go. I like to get everybody's perspective outside of the New York bubble of what the Knicks are doing. And you are set up for one of the easiest questions that's probably ever going to, going to happen. And it's more of like, how do you think the Knicks are doing this season? The team that's currently got the longest winning streak in the NBA and the best net rating since December 4th. Um, your view of how the Knicks are doing, what they're doing and how high this could go. What do you, what do you think? It's funny when I came on your podcast last time, it feels like there was some pessimism on you think we're trying to trade yeah. Julius Randle for yeah. a bag of peanuts, you know? And yeah, now that they're on a nine game winning streak, 10 game, win well, probably 10 nine, game nine and, and we'll see if they take care of business, you know? <laughs> no, to be honest with you, I have not watched a lot of Knicks this season, uh, but I, I think that they've obviously outperformed their expectations. 
in terms of how I see this moving forward in terms of like maybe playoff rounds. I don't know. Be honest. Be honest. If they think they're a first round exit, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, you guys are currently going to be matched up against the four seed with Cleveland. I mean, obviously, if the season ended today, you know, I, I could definitely see a first round exit in that case. But yeah, the, the farthest I could see the Knicks making it is into the second round. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot of the the the, the acquisition of Jalen Brunson. I've, I've always been a big fan of Jalen Brunson. I don't know how you guys are enjoying that acquisition, but he's he's just a beast. And um who would you say is probably like the most surprising player that you guys have had this year in, ter- in terms of maybe the expectations going into the season and how they're performing now? Two things. How we feel about Jalen Brunson is I'm pretty sure in nine months, there will be a lot of sons named Jalen in the tri-state area here in New York. <laughs> um, and I got to be honest with you, the quickly thing has been great. And yeah. Jalen Brunson's, I mean, I thought he would be be great, but I just, I knew the usage was going to be higher. My my God, what Julius Randle has been this season yeah. has to be what is the biggest surprise because it's not so much that I didn't think like he'd be better than he was than last season, but like the three point shooting. It's not even that it's efficient. It, it, it's he's not going to shoot forty percent ever again, but he's taking like nine threes a game. So the volume's there. So you have to respect the three point shot, and his shot chart has been so catered to the modern analytical way of, of, of shots and where the best shots are to take that like they've transformed this guy into a positive again, especially like the last conversation I had with you was, will you take Terry Rozier? Uh, we'll take Terry Rozier and Gordon yeah. Hayward. If you take Fournier, Derek Rose and Julius Randall. And here we are on the other side of that. And I don't know. Can they use Randall to upgrade to Embiid? Can they keep Randall? And he's just like, like a positive and a, and a lifelong Nick and one of our guys forever. Like I have no idea what the, what the ceiling is for him anymore. And that has to be the biggest, biggest surprise. Um, Cause everything else kind of like gradually like, Oh, I mean, you quickly took a step up young player doing that. Like Mitchell Robinson taking a step up young player doing that RJ for, as much of a step sideways or step back that he's taking, it really hasn't held the team back. It might have, I might've said it lowered their ceiling a month ago, but again, they're 39 and 27, a game behind the the Cavs for the four seed. And I think they're going to scare a team or two in the playoffs and we'll see how, how far that goes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at Julius Randle's attempts from behind the arc right now. And that's crazy. Like last year it's 5.7 attempts mm-hmm. per 75 possessions. And now it's 8.5 attempts per 75 possessions. It's, it, it's jumping from the 56th percentile all the way up to the 92nd percentile in terms of just the attempts from that range. So I believe because Steph Curry missed all that, I, I'm trying to think he might lead the NBA in three point attempts this year. I'm actually going to pull it up now. It might be Buddy Heald. That actually has more. But the point being is that that's like the biggest change between this year and last year is he was so hesitant because two years ago, like when nobody was in the arena, he was making 40% of his threes. He's third in attempts. It's Jason Tatum, Anthony Edwards, and Julius Randle have the three most three point attempts this season. Um, Yeah, I, um, I, I, He's been outstanding this year, and it's like he's had moments where he struggled. And even then, I'm I'm able to be like the good has far outweighed the bad, and it's a, a giant reason why. I mean, look, made the All Star team, might make an All NBA team, um, and might be a lot of the reason why they're they're headed for a playoff berth in the next couple of weeks. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. very good. I'm I'm glad you're enjoying the season. <laughs> Thank you. I feel so bad now. <laughs> well, uh, I hope you're able to enjoy the game tomorrow night in some way. I hope. Um, in some way, <laughs> you're able to enjoy the game. I I made the the uh observation that the Hornets are spending like four straight days in New York City, which probably doesn't bode well for the second game <laughs> in that stretch. You know, um. So we'll we'll see if the uh, if that has anything to do with their performance on on Tuesday night. Uh, Rich, you've been great with your time. Um, I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, please tell everybody where they could find all of the work uh, you and the Busby crew do. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Richie Randall. Obviously, you can find our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We are not we're not in the top ten like you guys are when it comes to the charts, <laughs> but uh, we're. 
we're there. You can find us. And yeah. obviously, too, if you want to support us, you can always go to buzzbeat.substack.com. And we give out ad-free episodes with our podcast. But yeah, we're, we're mainly talking the Hornets right now. But as you mentioned prior, we'll probably get into some draft talk, too. I think our guys do a really good job of talking about some of the, the draft prospects. So even if you're not a Hornets fan, when we get into some of that stuff, that's always relevant to anyone, really. Mm, awesome. Richie, thanks for coming, man. Thank you.